Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is the 26th of February, 2014, and um, I've got this on because it's Hoodie's Up Day. There she is. Diane just joined us. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Um, we were just starting, so welcome. I had a couple different addresses for you, so and, and I think that may be a, a glitch for some a couple of other people, but. We're, others may be joining us, let's just put it that way. <clears throat> um, so we are gathered here <laughs> um, on the second anniversary of uh, Trayvon, Trayvon Martin's uh, mm -hmm. death, and, 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 um, and sadly we are talking about another um, incident similar in Florida, um, um, Jordan Davis and that trial and um, all the things that have happened around that over the past couple of weeks. Um, so we're going to get into it a little bit. Uh, we've invited mainly um, authors of a document, and I think we, if you guys don't mind, we could start by your describing how the document, I think it's called Teaching About the, um, <laughs> the Jordan Davis Murder Trial, I think is uh, the title. And it's been posted here and there. Um, and it's a Google document, and uh, so let's start there, if you don't mind. Uh, somebody want to say what the issue was, how that document got started? And basically, we're a bunch of educators talking about, you know, how to approach this with students, why we're approaching it, and how it's going so far. Kind of fair enough introduction. Who wants to jump in there <laughs> with how this, how your document got started? Chris, why don't you jump in? Sure. Um, it actually started. Chris Lehman, go ahead. By the way, we should do int brief introductions when you start. Sure. Uh, my name is Chris <laughs> Lehman. I'm the principal at Science Leadership Academy in Philadelphia. Um, uh, it started kind of strangely, insofar as um, there was actually a big dialogue going on online about why educators in the ed tech world really weren't talking about the Jordan Davis murder trial verdict and, and um, uh, one prominent educator was kind of, in my opinion, being less than kind of kind about the fact that we were talking about that and uh, a couple of us asked him to help and to talk about it and to activate his membership base to teach about it in his class and, and in their classes. and. Um, I asked him if he would collaborate on a document with me to create some lesson plans around it. And he didn't ever respond to that, but a couple of us were talking online and we realized that that would be a really good idea to do no matter what. And uh, so we opened up a Google Doc and I invited, uh, you know, a bunch of us invited a bunch of people. I invited the SLA uh, uh, English and History teachers to take part. Um, a group of us who talk about these issues kind of got together and started talking and sort of over about 18 hours we really um, kind of did this uh, curriculum sprint that, and I think it was really based on the idea that uh, we all felt a really big need to do something, you know, and we're teachers and that's what we do. So, by the way, if anybody has the broadcast on behind, you want to not have that on while you're in the Hangout, that's great. Jose, you're just getting here. Do you want to uh, say hello and jump in? Uh, does he hear us yet? Maybe not. Uh, th th thanks for that, uh, brief uh, that brief description. Um, why don't we just go around and get uh, quick introductions uh, so that we're, we're sort of uh, more complete here at this point. Um, uh, Al, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. And I'll sort of say what you're thinking about all of this briefly, too. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm Al Elliott, fifth grade educator, uh, host of Monday's Eve discussion, um, and concerned educator. Um, basically, um, in teaching fifth grade, and I teach all subjects, in, in the area of social studies, um, overall, like currently I'm teaching the Civil War. That's what we're on. And, and there are so many court cases and, and compromises and agreements that have shaped this, this nation, but, but all of it goes back to the legal system and how it works. And so, like, one of the things that I think is important to impress upon 
just students in general, is how important the courts, the laws, the interpretation of the laws are. Um, so with this particular instance, I, I, I just think that it's, it was a, I think that it is a teachable moment. Anytime when something that affects younger people uh, is, is in the news like this, I, I think there's something that a lot of times the students have already either heard about or have a, a certain curiosity about. So when you're able to engage the students to tie in something that's happening now and something that's happened in the past, I just think that's a, a, a good thing. So that's kind of just my overall um, take of it is just to start the dialogue and kind of get kids to ask questions. Most of the time, once my students start asking questions, they, they're, they're learning more than any questions that came with the curriculum or any questions that I can think of when they start introducing questions that they want to get answered. And that's kind of what I think any lesson on, on something as painful and as topical as, as this particular instance is. So, so that's ha my take. have you brought it up already yet with your fifth graders? or I haven't brought it up directly. It's kind of been brought up. Um, and, and, and not really as a class, but I have had students to come and ask me, have I, like most of the time this, when something like that happens in the news, I have a student come at me, Mr. Day, have you heard, but most of the time they're either repeating something they've heard a parent say or older brother say. They may not necessarily know what happened, but they all know somebody that, that's close to me was upset. <laughs> and so have you heard about it too? And so that'll kind of be the way it, it'll be introduced uh, to mm -hmm. it. But as an official lesson, I haven't come in with, with this lesson and say, okay, today this is what we're discussing. Uh, uh -huh. No. Diana Laffenberg, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, okay. I am currently teaching in Flagstaff, Arizona. I'm finishing out the school year um, as a social studies teacher, seventh grade. Um, and I help collaborate on the document um, a fair bit. Uh, and did end up teaching that to the seventh graders on Monday and Tuesday of this week. And so I did um, the activity that I had um, taken some time to kind of piece together and flesh out on that day and, and did use that with the kids in class on my, took it, it took like two halves of, of two days. So, um, you know, about 60, 70 minutes of class time mm -hmm. and had a pretty interesting dialogue about it. Can you say a little more about what your interest was and why you, in helping to make the document and you know, bringing the issue to your students? So part of it for me, well, A, Chris asked me to. Um, <laughs> B. Um, it's called leadership, are, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, these are also very interesting. Um, I'm, I'm a huge, I mean, for many of the reasons that Al said already, you know, being able to work with kids historically and tie other historical moments of injustice and bring it forward and talk about kind of the complex nature of justice and injustice and the legal system and kind of the entanglement there and try to figure out, you know, I, th I think of these as, as kind of academic puzzles for myself of how do you take something that is, you know, so big and awful as what happened and really invite the kids in to think critically about it and and how to kind of engage with it. So it's, you know, a, a, that blend of what Al was talking about with current events and history and trying to find the flow. And then also, you know, what's the appropriate seventh grade thing to do when you're trying to do this um, with kids? Can I press you on appropriate? Sure. Yeah. What do you mean by appropriate? So, yeah. uh, I mean, for the audience. So, like, um, I would have taught a different lesson to 11th and 12th okay. graders than um, if to 7th graders. So when I had to, like, consider what the background of my students were, um, how versed they were in things like Stand Your Ground, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's considering who you're teaching, what background information they're already operating from. You know, if it would have been the SLA students, they would have been very versed in the Trayvon Martin um, case. This would have been a continuation of a conversation and we would have kind of entered that at a very different place. These kids um, weren't as involved or, or um, I mean they were two years ago they were 10 and 11 years old. They weren't as kind of aware of what that was. So we kind of had to back up and I had to really think about what was the way forward which is also, you know, part of what I was trying to do with the document was to give people who didn't have kids with a background a way in to start the conversation if they didn't know where to start. Mm -hmm.
Jose, how's your sound? Are you there yet? Jose, can you check in? Mm, we can't hear you yet. <laughs> we can't hear you. Can you hear us? No, I see you talking, but it's not coming <laughs> on yet. Uh, okay, so I don't think he's muted. No? So we'll have to work on that. Um, Jose, if you can, there's a little flower at the top. Uh, we'll, you can check your sound properties there, I think. But, and or, Jose, can you take your headsets off and just talk? <laughs> that sometimes works. Right. So, you want to work that out? We can do that. Well, let's move on to Josh. Introduce yourself, and then we'll come back to Josh sure. Wilson, who's working out his sound issues. Go ahead. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Joshua Block, and I teach humanities. I teach students humanities, so history and English at Science Leadership Academy. And um, I think one thing that I really appreciate about the doc that everyone worked on together was. The ways that, um, similar to what Diana was saying, that it really, it, it works for many different student populations. And I think these types of issues are crucial to teach about. And my personal angle would be that it's very important for students in my classes to see themselves and to see historical figures and current figures not so much as subjects that things just happen to them, but see themselves as agents where they have the ability to change things. And at Diana's phrase about how um, in some classrooms, it's a, and depending on the student population, it's a continuation of a conversation that's been going on. So I felt very much for my students that's what this was. And some of the resources that I added to the document and different ideas are things that we have been doing um, in class that sadly are very relevant to this situation as well in terms of speaking about um, the different ways that laws are interpreted or framed on behalf of different population groups and also uh, but on much more positive notes about the ways that people do change things when injustice exists so um, that's really the way the conversation has proceeded in my classes and thinking about um, what's the role of citizens and in, in these situations where injustice is really um, I guess really obvious is the way to say it and then how does how do people go about beginning to change it? By the way, feel free. Anybody should inter uh, We're quickly and not so quickly getting the introductions, but anybody should feel free to interrupt at any point here. Mm -hmm. if you have a question for each other as well. But Josh, I, so I, I was just wondering, so what grade do you teach again? Uh, I teach tenth and twelfth grade. So did your students already know about the case when you got to it, or how did I it come would say, up? Um, Maybe fifty percent knew about the case. They all knew about Trayvon Martin. Mm -hmm. So they and they, so the stand your ground laws are um, is part of their consciousness and part of their awareness for all of them. I would say, uh, mm -hmm. but this specific case uh, for Jordan Davis, I would say maybe half of them knew about it um, when we started talking about it. In Pennsylvania, has stand your ground laws? Do they not? Uh, no, I don't believe they do. No? Actually, they have yeah. well, they have an expanded castle doctrine. Um, mm -hmm. In 2011, Pennsylvania passed. I mean, the castle doctrine has been on the books for a very long time, and in 2011, they expanded the castle doctrine to include your vehicle and to include your place of work. Um, there is some debate to me that is essentially stand your ground. To some other people they feel that it is still just an expanded uh, castle doctrine, and I think that depends on uh, where you sit on these things. But, um, yes, I, it is, it, it's a, it's pushing castle doctrine about as far as castle doctrine can go without just being straight stand your ground, and that's the most charitable read I think you could give on it, maybe. Just to get everybody's voice in here, Mike, uh, and, and Jose, anytime you can start talking, please do. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. Right. Oh, there we there go. go. There we Let go. Him go. Okay, go for it. Introduce just, yourself. Uh, <laughs> I'm Jose. I write. I teach. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what what is there? Uh, A little hi, more so specific. Where do you where do you teach? Where do you write? I teach in New York City. I write on the JoseWilson.com, featured in a bunch of different places. Um, very proud to have been part of this conversation, cause um, that's you know, it 
if it was, <laughs> some people might attest to some of my incendiary comments having prompted some of these conversations. Um, to that end, and of course, Dan is like nodding her head, like, yeah. Uh, but I would say that being able to find something productive to do with all that energy was a really positive thing to have, and then to have my uh, my lady Luz get involved as well. Uh, was also pretty awesome in, in that respect because we, we really do believe in culturally responsive education. Say more Jose about also, yeah, Paul, uh, important is, you know, to note that Jose is also the author of the soon to be released This Is Not a Test, available from Haymarket Books, and uh, is an absolute must read for uh, all educators uh, who believe in culturally responsive education. Um, he didn't plug himself, so I felt the need to do so for him. I, I appreciate that. Thanks. <laughs> Any plugging is all cool. So, Jose, tell tell me, tell us a little more about um, like how how you decided it was an important issue, though. Like, where did your thinking? Like, did you hear the verdict and say, "Oh, I got to bring this into school. I got to connect with other educators"? How you know? What was your process a little bit? My process was my birth. Um, <laughs> we can start I, there. Go ahead. <laughs> we could. I, I, I think there's something to be said for someone who uh, was raised in the projects, born, you know, in poverty, knows what it's like. And I think that's what's missing a lot in the education debate. Uh, there seems to be a lot of um, a, a lack of reflection of what the students would be. In you know whatever education debate there is, so you'll have someone who will go on the local radio station talking about the use of the N word, but they have never had the N word applied to them. Uh, I think that's you know there's something very um, there's a, there's a disconnect there. And so when it came to this Jordan Davis piece, which I've been following now for the last you know a, 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 for a while now, mm -hmm. I just started thinking about how if this was my son. Well, how would I have approached this? And of course, he very well could be my son, much the way that a lot of, you know, the black boys and girls and kids of color in general uh, could look like my son or daughter. And I'm always in, in, you know, in awe of those who do stand up and say, okay, well, we need to do something about this, uh, versus just standing to the sideline and hoping that. Google releases a new product or that Samsung gives them a new watch or whatever it is, uh, that they actually talk about the real issues out there uh, despite themselves and try to learn. So that's that's a critical piece for me. If I could jump in, like, he, he actually brought up, like, if it was his son, like, my, my initial interest in the Trayvon Martin case and in, in this case and, and in cases like this, I have a 14-year-old son, like, Start in high school, walking around, and and the high school that he attends is is predominantly white. Um, it's a great high school. I'm glad he goes there, and 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 I'll be happy when he graduates and all that. But there are a lot of things because he's 14 and because he's led a relatively sheltered life, he just simply doesn't know about. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times these news stories, if if I don't bring them to him in a way that's that's real. It's just another news story to him. It it doesn't hit home because he 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 was raised in in, in a time where um, he could be sheltered. You know, I mean, it, every every person of of color uh, doesn't have the same history, but it, but at at the at the same time, we we all share certain facts <laughs> that are just real. Um, I'm, and so the same facts for me growing up, uh, you know, with certain neighborhoods when you drive through. You just got to be conscious, you know, uh, making sure that your insurance papers are in order. You know, you got your papers in order. You got your driver's license, your tags, all of that. Um, and so my, my interest was, was yeah, my, my class and my students, but as on a more personal note, like I, I got a 14-year-old that's going to in, inherit my whole kingdom. He, he, he's all I got. So I got to look out for all my eggs in, in that basket, so to speak. So what have those conversations gone like? Good. Those conversations have been interesting because I'm a conspiracy theorist, right? <laughs> and, and I'm glad and, you put that right up front, Alex. Yeah, no, I am. Listen, I don't think we ever been to the moon. That's another hangout. Okay. We can talk about all of it. But I'm a conspiracy theorist first, right? 
Uh, and and so my and and sometimes so my my son is old enough to kind of you know we we toss back and forth some of the crazy ideas. So our conversations have have kind of been like to him every time something like this happens, it's the it's the first time, right? Like it's it's like an anomaly. It's it's not like a history of right. I have to bring up well. Let's look at the similarity between this. Okay, now let's look back at this. Okay, now let's look back at this. For him, it is 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 more like wow. That's that's a messed up story. Not here we go again type thing. So I and 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 it, and it has to be a balance for me because I don't, I don't want to send Nat Turner back to the high school, you know, and 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 make him have a, an, an uncomfortable environment, you know, for him to go back to every day. So I'm always kind of guarded and wait for the the summers uh, to really unleash because I know you had to go to you know school every day. But for for the most part, um, is is it's like surprising to him. That that I think the things that I think, uh, so, but they're always educational for both of us. We should get everybody else's voice in here if you don't mind. Um, Mike, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Mike Thayer. I teach math in uh, in uh, New Jersey, public high school in New Jersey. Um, I started teaching. Uh, way back a million years ago at a place called the Beacon School with a guy named Chris Lehman. So that's how sort of my uh, relationship to to a lot of this took place. And, and through Chris and other people, I've been fortunate enough to meet some truly astonishing minds, which has been awesome. And I was in kind of a strange situation because... We, my district was off all last week. We had a uh, as mine we had, was. Yes. We yeah we had a we had a February break, which we desperately needed after you know having three hard days of school in the month of February. So um, <laughs> you know, we were we were we were really ready for break and you know following on off of midterms. So we were really ready for break. Um, so my looking at this project was just more to see if I if you know what could happen I mean out of something so awful and out of something so wrong um, and, and I I've, I've used this phrase before and I hate using this phrase because I don't know but I don't have a better one which is to try and give something so awful some meaning and, and and that's not even that's not even what I what I really mean. But if something possibly positive, if some kind of conversations could happen as a result that would take that horror, lower it a notch. I, I can't even I can't even articulate what I'm trying to say, but it just seemed important to do. And you know, my little tiny, tiny, tiny contribution to it was just a couple of things that I had read um, going along. But I was just astonished at how amazingly well the thing came together. And how quickly it came together! I couldn't. I could not believe. This is the of, what was the it, curriculum the document. Uh -huh. Yeah, the, I mean, was it fifteen hours basically? Is that, that, is that what I'm remembering? Um, that something, something like that could come together so fast and I, so well. Anybody, Mike, I, I just wanted. To, does anybody know? Has anybody iterated on it? I mean, I threw together a Guru collection of materials. And I've seen some things here and there, but has there anything else built around it? Or people said, oh, this is cool, but here's what I'm going to do? Yeah. Has anyone um, seen anything? Yeah. I know people have, taught, have have used it. I don't know, mm -hmm. and I think mm -hmm. that, you know, I, I had a couple of people reach out and say, hey, I used it in my class. It was kind of, you know, it sparked an amazing conversation. It was wonderful to have that resource there. Uh, and I think people borrowed liberally from it, which I think is mm -hmm. awesome. I don't know that anybody wrote up I haven't seen blog entries yet of people writing, here's how I used it, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, I think fine. But I, I think it, 
it is important. I mean, it you know, I think it felt uh, to echo Mike's ideas. I don't know, if felt good is the right term, but it felt um, useful to know that it got used. I guess is the way I would put it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Um, introducing Hillary here too. Hillary, do you want to introduce yourself and talk about? the project that you were connected with a little bit. Sure, can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you fine. Okay, um, I mean I'm here mostly to listen but I'm, I'm Hillary from the Dream Yard Project. We're in the South Bronx um, and we're actually a, a arts education nonprofit so I'm an out of school educator um, and I'm actually the one of the program directors at the Art Center. I run the middle and high school programs but we have a, a program that we run um, called Action which is a four-year arts and activism program. So I believe, Paul, you saw today I posted that our um, young people who are now juniors in high school, um, there's about 15 of them, uh, created a campaign. They've been looking at gun violence since this summer, actually since the um, George Zimmerman verdict. They have been thinking about delving into uh, drugs and the drug trade and looking at that, but then the George Zimmerman verdict came around um, and they decided to do work around that. So they all look at current issues um, through the different arts, so poetry, um, visual arts, and theater, mostly. Um, and they actually put together a radio drama, but it's actually performed on, the, on a stage um, about gun violence um, and racism um, and many other things. They use satire. They use straight up just talking about the issues. Um, and then now they've created a campaign for this second anniversary of Trayvon's death um, called Silence. The violence, um, and I can, I can put a link in the chat to their Facebook page, but they're basically, I think, going along with the hoodies up today, uh, trying to get everyone to, um, you know. Did you mean to mute her? I don't think you did. No, I screwed up. <laughs> when my students figure out that they can do that, they have lots of fun with it. But Hillary, sorry, you can unmute yourself. Do you see where to do that? Oh, there you go. So powerful. You're back. Okay. It was an accident. There. Yeah. I can't hear her, so I was trying to see if oh, you can't I hear her. Oh, unmute her myself or something. I can like hear her. Can, can anyone else hear? Yes. yes. Okay. Go ahead. Yep. So, briefly described uh, what what they were trying to do today, or what they did today. Sure. So. Um, Today, uh, and again, I'm not the direct teacher of the group, so I don't have it all at the, the tip of my um, tongue what they're doing, but they basically had a four-step process they were sending to people. They created a Facebook page, um, and the step, first step was to wear a dark hoodie in memory of Trayvon, um, to put a name tag on the hoodie with a person you either know or you know of uh, who's a victim of gun violence, then take a picture of, that, of yourself with that and, and make it your profile picture and use the ha uh, hashtag silence the violence. And then step four was to really take action to organize friends to do something more. Um, so they have to sign a petition to end gun violence, unite and rally, write a letter to your mayor. Um, and they've been doing a lot uh, of great work just leading up to this. Uh, and then I'm, I'm actually not sure what exactly they've talked about with the Jordan Davis trial yet, but I'm so interested to look at this curriculum now. It was new to me since Paul invited me here. Um, I think they're really, if they haven't seen it already, they're really um, probably going to use it. Um, I would hope, but I'll make sure they get their hands on it as well. And and I, I just uh, sometimes forget to introduce myself. I'm I'm Paul Wilson, and I teach at a new school called New Direction Secondary School. We have sixth and seventh graders. They are young people who have been turned away and turned off of school already in sixth grade, and um, so it's an exciting, difficult, wonderful group of kids to work with. Um, and most of my students didn't know about what happened. A few did sort of in the back say, oh yeah, I heard something about it. So just letting them know what happened and figuring out what happened was, was uh, has been so far really remarkable. Um, and I started with uh, um, Jordan's mother's testimony before the Senate committee, um, which is really, a, a, I think, a, a powerful six paragraphs. Um, so that's a uh, that's where we are. We're analyzing that and looking at some of the other work. But I think just following her in the press has been <laughs> fascinating. Um, she's a, a quite a quite a spokesperson, it seems to me. But so that's uh, some of what's going on with me. So there we are, half an hour. And we just barely introduced ourselves. But uh, so where do we where do we want to go with this? There's what are you thinking? 
Who wants to jump in with a question for this group right here? A thought. I could jump in with a comment more than a question. Good. Um, I think one thing that's interesting Josh. to me is, yeah, this is Josh speaking, um, is that uh, this clearly needs to be a conversation within our country for young people and for people of all ages. And I think what's what struck me about the document and from hearing from people now is just really the ways the conversation is different for different student population groups, meaning that it, it, it's a huge issue in our country, but um, it's not the same conversation throughout our country, which yeah, on one hand is maybe an obvious comment, but on the other hand I think is really crucial to think about from a teaching perspective. Yeah, and I'll, I'll jump in a little bit on that. That was part of um, the switch I had to flip. Um, I just started teaching this group of students on February 10th, and I haven't taught seventh graders in six years, and and in a different part of the country than I'd been teaching, and it and it took a minute to really consider, you know, what are the conversations they are having? How can this relate? Age group, background, all of those things, um, and that was a really important part of it for me. Yeah, I I mean I think it's interesting. You know, I um, and the funny thing is, you don't always have to go that far. Uh, I I had to go to a school meeting in suburban Philadelphia, in the suburbs of Philadelphia, recently, and the way people talked about their world when that world was half an hour from, if that, from the city limits of Philadelphia. Um, it reminded me uh, of how different our worlds are and there's no way that the conversations that we were having at SLA around Jordan Davis were the same conversations that would have happened out there, um, at least not at first. And I think one of the things that's really fascinating about some of the stuff that we've done at SLA, whether it was you know the one that comes to mind immediately is the way that Diana uh, my goodness, six years ago now, um, did a project on election day where our kids went out and talked about the 2008 elected, uh, election and what it meant in Philadelphia, and we partnered up with a school in rural Texas where they went out and talked with, ki with people in the voting lines and all that, and did the exact same thing that we were doing, but the way that the elections were, talk were talked about and the candidates were talked about and the visceral reactions different people had in our two, in our two communities to the election was amazing and I think that um, one of the things that needs to happen is we need to find a way to have these conversations where our community expands and people who are living in Arizona um, or people who are living in suburban Philadelphia can hear the way people in Philadelphia are reacting to this case and understand why some of the reactions are different. And I think that that's something that we need to see more of. I think like uh, what you mentioned in trying to have more of those conversations, um, I think that would be awesome. But I think one of the things is how do you get people that don't really care about issues like this or like they're – there are certain news stories I can watch on the news that just strike a chord with me. I mean, it just depends. It could be, you know, most of the time it has something to do with a child. I mean, or, or you know, just somebody that was hurting it will just resonate with me. But you've got droves of people where it's kind of like, man, that's terrible. You know, now I'm going to, you know, put it on a game show or I'm going to play a video game. I mean, they genuinely don't care. Like, how do you think you, you expand just the, the emotional connection, the, the human connection that should be there, when, when, when there is an injustice, right, um, how do you get, the, you know, the masses to, to, to care, that don't, to, to expand that conversation? Like, how do you do that? And can I, and if I could add to that, some of the pushback that I've received from some of my colleagues in the New York City Reading Project, um, in, in very gentle, professional terms, um, was, you know, how does this fit your literature curriculum? You know, um, and and how does uh, and then here's a list of all these other social issues. 
are you covering those too? You know, what about Title IX? Um, <laughs> you know, yeah. So, so you know, I, I think if if in a less polite forum, um, they might have been more blunt and say, "Really? How does this fit your curriculum?" You know. Um, I, I, yeah. I mean, I, I think the better question is, how doesn't it fit yours? You know, I mean, we currently have a law on the books in multiple states in our country which say racial fear is now a justification for shooting someone. But that's the thing. That's a law on the books. Like it's already been discussed, it's been determined, and the result was was here is this law that solves this problem, right? So the the law became a law because some people decided it was supposed to be. So, right. but we a lot of people are still there. Like everybody's not against staying your ground. Sure, but I think that we need to have a convert. But I think now, I mean, the study that just came out uh, a few months ago that said that. States that had stand your ground laws saw a dramatic increase in the number of murders since the laws were passed. I think the data that shows that when stand your ground is invoked, the racial bias around when it is an acceptable defense and when it is not, we now have real data. It's not just I feel a certain way now. And I think but, that, I mean, that I just keep conversation. But like we've got real data, like what I know, according to the census, you know, people of color, black people, like thirteen percent of the population, and over fifty percent of the prisons. Like it's a racial bias in in the state I live in. There are more traffic violations given to people. Which, by the way, is Alabama. Go ahead. Go ahead. Right, it's okay. Alabama, and and, yeah. and and we get more traffic violations. In, I mean, are black people just terrible drivers in Alabama? That's what I'm. What I'm saying is the data. The jury has been in you know, pun intended, a long time about there being racial biases and injustices. So it's, it's almost like it, it, instead of, hey, now here's this thing that exists, it's like, well, here we go again. You know what I mean? Like, but, you know. I, I mean, I, guess on some level, I just think that's a conversation worth having. Even if it is, here we go again, that's, that is a, convert. you know, Asking the fundamental question of what is the country we want to live in, what is the world we want to live in, and how do we make that world happen? I think, I think one of the things that is difficult too is that there is not one answer to that question. When you when you talk about things like what is the country we want to live in. What is the country that, you know, what, what, what is the vision for the future? That vision varies dramatically um, depending on who you are, your, your race, your gender, your, the part of the country that you're in, your, your religious background. And, and I think one of the things that is so difficult and has always been difficult but now it just seems to becoming I, I guess it just feels like it's becoming more present because it's being it in, in a lot of ways it's being covered better in a, in a weird way um, I mean you, you hear about things like this a lot more my, my sense is that a lot of things were just kind of silently accepted throughout history and you know now we're in a place where you know the, the things are out there and they're 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 being discussed and they're being argued and it's going to take time for people to either figure out how to agree to disagree with each other humanely or you know or or come to some other settlement so my you know, can I can I um, put you in the spotlight though and say sure. so? What about, what about math curriculum? I mean, well, after... <laughs> oh sure. I mean, you know, we had a. Well, I, had but, a... I mean, to be Chris just mm -hmm. talked about data sets and you know murder rates and so forth. So there's... absolutely. I mean, there's there's a huge. 
there is there is a growing recognition among many math educators that issues of social justice have not been brought into the curriculum, never have been, and that it's time for them to perhaps start taking a role in that way, looking at things like incarceration rates, relative incarceration rates, relative you know mortgage rates that you offer to, to people of different colors or back you know backgrounds based on you know based on whatever um, and can I just uh, remind us all that Jose you're a math teacher too right yeah that's the rumor <laughs> <laughs> so I should I mean so you have any thoughts on how this fits math too or I actually um, I I don't have too many thoughts on how it fits math in only because of the the increasing pressures of et cetera, et cetera, curriculum and trying to make sure that my kids can even make it to the next level of high school, especially in eighth grade. Uh, having said that, I was able to get into a conversation today about the, it was the start of the unit for Animal Farm, and there were two discussions on the board regarding responsibility and, resp responsibility and knowledge and then freedom with power. And uh, I was invited to get in there, and of course, the two big questions were like, "Is there such a thing as having too much uh, knowledge or too much responsibility?" And the second one was, "Wow, I wonder how this connects to Jordan Davis and Trayvon Martin with regards to power, responsibility, and knowledge." Um, and of course, I let the kid, the kids, all did did all the talking, but. I was trying to lead them towards a certain direction, and you know, hopefully tomorrow we'll continue that dialogue. So I'm glad this came up. To be honest, were they informed enough about the case? Do you think? Or? No, um, and I'm not sure what that's about either. Um, I think some of that has to do with just, um, I guess, a lack of news on in like Univision and all the other places where they watch news. Um, I didn't see too much news about it in the Spanish newspapers, Spanish language newspapers, so maybe that has something to do with it. Um, but I, frankly, a lot of that has to do with just me, and I, I wish I could do more with regards to math and social justice issues. And again, if, if, if math teachers are out there looking for resources, Bob Moses yeah. uh, and the Algebra Project is an amazing resource for using mathematics to examine uh, uh, issues of social justice and, and what have you. He's, he's done, and his crew has have done amazing work on that. Yeah, I was actually, I worked with Bob Moses in, in the Algebra Project in Mississippi, uh, Arkansas. It is, is truly a, a, um, it's an amazing experience. At the time, I had no idea historically who he was and who the group of educators were and how they came to be. It was like my second year teaching ever. And it was like, hey, you want to be an algebra project teacher? I was like, cool. It was, you know, like to me it was just something cool to do. And then after being involved with it, you know, how they made sure all of the students were exposed to like, you know, books and documentary, the spirit of Ella, the civil rights movement, uh, the, the, that whole thing was just built around uh, the, the, the new way to keep people of color or minorities out of certain areas was basically the lack of understanding of the higher mathematics and sciences. And so he created this whole transitional curriculum, and it was just awesome to have been a part of it. But yeah, Bob, Bob Moses is, like, awesome. Mm -hmm. You know, what you just mentioned, uh, David D. Um, had an <clears throat> interview with somebody from Mississippi who I don't know. But anyway, the, the, one, of the, one of the almost conspiracy theories, but if you hear the whole thing, it's probably not. Um, what, what for him tied together Jordan Davis and Trayvon Martin is that they were, they were not the guys down the street who might have guns who would fire back, right? So they, they happened to be guys who, who um, you know, were in the wrong place. So that's, that's pretty scary that that's maybe what people are feeling or thinking. But, yeah. <laughs> that that got a big. Anyway, but, you know, let me add one more thought that that I, that my student, uh, student, one of my students, talked about. Uh, oddly, he talked about how the whole thing was reminding him of an experience he had 
where somebody who was during a snowstorm had a um, windshield wiper. Right? This is a sixth grader out playing around, windshield wiper that she had pulled up, and he threw it back. And she grabbed him and was like, and it scared him, right? The thing is, that happens all the time, right? There are young people messing around that kind of way all the time. But then when you take that kind of hate or that response to young people and then you mix in the racism, it is, is what I'm starting to think is, is getting ugly. But, so those are just... So, like, how these trivial incidents can, can become these major, you know, somebody getting killed is what is hard to understand. What I, I, I'm, I, I read something, and I cannot, I cannot remember where I read it, but I read something about, very recently, about how, you know, teenagers behave in certain ways because that's just what they're doing. They're testing authority. They're, they're playing music loudly. They're, they're you know, they're, they're back talking. They're, you know, they're, they're testing the boundaries. They're developing their personalities. They're doing all of those things. And, you know, certain kids, you know, you have a bunch of white kids in a car playing the music too loud there are a bunch of white teenagers in a car playing music too loud. And they get yelled at and people walk away and that's kind of the end of it. You have four African American kids in a car playing music too loud and it's it's different somehow. And and it's it's that I would I, this, I would this, add in a state where, you know, their guns are really prevalent too. But <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I yeah, I yes. I, I you know, I, I guess you know, having lived in a lot of different parts of the country, I'm really, really reticent to say that certain parts of the country are or are not more likely to be prone to violence like yeah. that. Sure. Um, you know, I, I mean, maybe that's just me. Maybe that's that's not right. But I'm well, just I, I don't. I, I think I, mean, I think maybe that the availability of the guns matters, but. You mm -hmm. still can have things like this that don't involve guns anywhere. Sure. Jose, were you going to say something? Or no, uh, I was anybody say, jump in yet? Yeah. Well, well, whatever Mr. Say was, whatever Mr. Thayer said, that exactly right. Um, it, it could happen anywhere, and I think we're often too quick to uh, say, "Well, this sort of thing only happens in one part of the country," while neglecting, you know, all the other things overtly or covertly that can happen in any part of the country. Um, no matter how progressive we may or may not believe we are. Yeah. And the yeah. one thing I wanted to jump in yeah. and say is when I was when I was teaching this, um, you know, I would lead him down the path. We looked at five different moments of pretty awful injustice, um, both from the court system and from the government in American history or current events, and then shared the Jordan Davis story, and then you know led him down the path of you know kind of asking us several questions. And then toward the end of it, I said, would this be different um, were the race of the people reversed? And they, and it's, it's pretty interesting when you, you're kind of on a roll with asking questions. They just keep answering in a very mm -hmm. kind of honest way. And they said, yes. And I said, why? And this girl just, I mean, it, it was the first thing she thought of, and then she felt horrible for saying it. And she said, because he's black. I mean, she just, she knew the answer. And this is a community that doesn't, you know, have, um, it's very diverse, but not with an African-American population. And the minute, the minute you change those circumstances, the, the, every kid in that room felt that. And, and they know that. And that is one of those just really awful, insidious things that exists under the layer of these circumstances and what isn't often talked about. And kids don't have a way to speak about it. And I don't think anybody's ever broached the issue with these particular kids ever. But it happened in two of the five classes just like that um, with kids. They knew they, it, was, it was so unfortunately and awfully automatic. Well, you know, like that actually reminded me of this study that I heard. It had nothing to do with race, but it was a study that a guy did how people are more inclined to recycle 
trash when the trash isn't destroyed, right? Like I was listening to NPR in the morning, and 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 so he was saying, so if you take an aluminum can and you bottle it up, people most of the time put it in a trash can. If the aluminum can is still a whole aluminum can, they'll recycle it. And so the the, the interviewer asked him, well, what's the point of the research? Why do you know that? And he said, well, with the study, after he himself became aware that he did that, he recycled more, even the bottled up can or not. So that just adds credence to having a conversation. Like a lot of people are just so unaware of biases that they hold until they have a conversation like that. So the power is having that little piece of uncomfortableness to be aware of, wait a minute, is that how I think? Is that what I feel? And then and just being aware of it helps you to change your thinking. I thought that was interesting. And what's what's the power on my African American Latino kids to study this? I mean, what's the, what's the what? I'm sorry, Paul. The the so you what you just what what Al just said there was was the power was was about like having the conversation makes you more aware of your biases, right? Um, right. But I'm just wondering. So what's the power on the African American Latino kids in my classroom? I mean. I, well, like everybody has these so, biases that they're unaware of, right? Okay. Like it's it's not all one sided. Like I I have to be very careful, especially when I'm teaching the Civil War, because it's real easy to think that everybody white has slaves, everybody black was a slave. Uh, Abraham Lincoln signed Emancipation, and Martin Luther King marched into freedom. Like it's very easy because because you get these chunks of of that was pretty easy, <laughs> right? Right. I mean, but yeah. but uh, it's, especially in February, right? Like everything's compressed. <laughs> you don't know what happened when or, or, or whatever. But a lot of times we're not aware. People, I'm saying when I say we, I'm saying people of color. A lot of times we're not aware of certain biases that we have. The, the thing is in the society that we live in, a lot of times our biases don't coincide with institutionalized problems, right? Like if, 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 if I'm a racist or prejudiced or whatever, uh, it's not going to increase the number of white people in my neighborhood going to jail or getting speeding tickets or being shot or whatever. So uh, it, a, a, a lot of times the biases of minority it just doesn't amount to the, the same end result as other groups, mm -hmm. only because of the institutions that govern us, you know? So, but I do think it's important to, to have those conversations with everybody to show that every, because it, what it does is help humanizes the enemy, which I think is important to humanize the enemy and not demonize the enemy, right? Like, whoever the jurors were, I'm, I'm more upset with, with the whole justice system than I am with anybody pulling the trigger. Because all they did was pull the trigger. It was the system that said, okay, you're not guilty, or you're guilty, or you're acquitted, or, like, they just, you know, committed a crime, quote-unquote, until, you know, proven otherwise. So I think how do you address these systemic problems is, 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 is the conversation, too, or shouldn't be left out of the conversation. So I have a complicated question, and maybe we'll end with it. But it, and, and to be a little more specific about uh, one of the controversies out there right now is what is the message that we you know, mothers need to give to their young African American children? Right? Is the message, you know, when somebody turns says turn down the music, turn it down, or you're going to end up shot? Right? Are we are we teaching this curriculum to keep kids safe? Or, you know, are we teaching them to say, you know what, <laughs> you know, this this is an incident that shows that, uh, you know, and, you know it, it's not right to, to not be who you are, right? So, as so so, and then the complicate the way to complicate that is that on that controversy and in the curriculum that I put together in the Guru collection, there are articles that represent both sides of that. Um, and I don't want to take a position on that myself, but I, so my bigger question here and what is a teacher thinking like, wow, this is, this is like filled with a lot of traps that I could get into. How do we encourage teachers to go ahead and do it anyhow? You know, because you're going to get it wrong. You're not going to necessarily have the right positions on things. You're going to make mistakes, but 
Is that a fair question to end with here? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think yeah. on one level, mm -hmm. um, you know, not for nothing, my answer is somewhat, uh, the SLA people are all going to chuckle when I say it, is it involves inquiry and it involves care. You know, um, you ask a lot of really good questions. You don't tell them the answers to them. And then make sure that you that every kid in that room knows more than anything else that you love them and that you care about them and that you worry, you know, and that you don't have answers. And I think that, you know, I think that if all we do is teach our children, you know, turn down your music or bad things can happen or what have you, then we're doing them a disservice. But I think if we also make sure that we teach them the world they live in but also give them the agency and the tools to change the world that they live in, that becomes the really powerful thing, right? I mean, so there's thing one, how do you navigate a complex, unsafe world? And then there's thing two, how do you actively engage with that world to change it? And, and I mean, I, I look at, I mean, I think of the work that both Diana and Josh have done uh, in their history classes engaging the kids in action-oriented work to empower them to change their world, to not accept the fact that the world has to be the way it is. Cool. Thanks. Could, um, we are top of the hour here. Could we go around and hear what you've been thinking, your last thoughts, everyone else? Diana, do you want to jump in? Sure. Um, one of the things that... that uh, I, I keep thinking about, because I have taught in four really distinctly different parts of the country, urban mm -hmm. and rural, not so much suburban, um, but mm -hmm. one of the things that you know was, was most interesting to me is, is I tried to include examples with my students that included other racial groups with different versions of injustice, and in, in a community that is a large portion of Native American students, Many of the kids in the room had no idea what had gone on with the um, boarding schools and the Native American students. Mm. And I, I would sit there and ask kids, who did this happen to? Who do you think, whose story this is? And was really trying to get them to think about what this might be. And there was this girl that says almost nothing. Um, in seven days, I hadn't heard her speak. And she was one who said, that was the Native American. The more we talk about this stuff, the, the more we invite everybody into a conversation about the the real kind of fabric and some of it's bad and some of it's really awful but it, the only point for doing any of this is to hope that every time we have this conversation it gets a little bit better we use our position as teachers to keep asking the questions and inviting kids to the conversation. Hillary, do you want to check in one more time? Hi. <laughs> Just what you're thinking. Yeah, um, yeah. Thinking lots of things, and thank you all so much. I'm glad I, I joined uh, tonight. Um, I'm thinking about the power of art. Um, when the Trayvon uh, or the George Zimmerman verdict came through, our action project did a lot of great work with looking at like a song from Lauren Hill called "Rebel" um, that speaks a lot about um, violence and how you can use art as sort of a second lens on these things and um, and let the students respond to that. Um, but they also need just facts and background. I think a lot of you mentioned that, that maybe even our students don't know about this, um, and that might be why they're apathetic about it at times. Um, and also just being really sensitive to silence and emotions, and we, we saw that when we did different things around the George Zimmerman case. Some people were just kind of like shrug their shoulders, and some girls just burst into, you know, some people just burst into tears, and you never know what they're bringing. You don't know if they know someone who's a victim of gun violence. So being respectful of that and giving young people that space, I'm sure that's much harder in a regular public school classroom, but letting them hear each other's experiences with it and also have time to just sort of take it all in. It is, it's heavy. It's a lot. It can happen in public school, too. But yes. <laughs> great, <laughs> great points you made. There. Josh, you have any thoughts? Um, my final thought is really about the how everyone has a need to have their stories be heard and to have their experiences validated regardless of who they are. And um, I appreciate what Paul said that there's a lot of risk involved in teaching in this way, but I also I almost feel like the risk is greater not to 
bring these issues up in a classroom because this is the world we live in and the country we live in and to not um, address issues like this in the classroom would just feel like we would be talk talking about a fantasy land and it would not relate to any of our lives and um, I feel really strongly that um, particularly our public schools are these democratic institutions where we need to sort out the issues that our country is facing and I feel like young people in safe classroom environments do an amazing job of it um, and whether it's a mixed classroom environment or whatever the population in the classroom environment is and uh, there really is a lot of power to to focusing on these stories and then taking that and thinking about how can we work towards a, a, a society that is more about universal rights and about justice. And Mike? I think one of the, th one of the things that, that I've been sort of mulling over is the idea of empathy and the idea of empathy being need to ca be cast wider, more widely than it has been. Um, the world is a much more connected place than it was when I was in high school. Um, you know, when many of us were in high school or earlier. And we teachers, I think, have a responsibility to make sure that our students know that we care for them when they walk in the door, know that it's important to us that they respect each other and that they listen to each other with empathy and that we as teachers listen to them with empathy. Um, I, you know, and then that can take place in any discipline in any type of school. Um, you know, I think there's just a real shortage of compassion in the world. And, and I think being able to, to demonstrate that to them in whatever way we can, model that for them in whatever way we can, I think now in the world that we live in now, I think that's even more important than it's ever been. And so I guess, you know, I guess that's just seeing, like I said, where, where this all, where this whole conversation started, seeing what happened, you know, to, to, to take something horrible and try and create something that could be used in a classroom that would model empathy, would, would demonstrate empathy, would show what's possible, um, I think was remarkable. It was a remarkable experience to be a little tiny part of. Thanks, Mike, for your thoughts. And Al, I don't know if you got last thoughts there or not. But no, I didn't, but I, I was just thinking just, I, I think it's important as educators to just remember Rome wasn't built in a day. A steady drip of water was a hole in a rock. And you don't have to teach it all on one horrible experience, you know. Unfortunately, there are millions of horrible experiences. <laughs> so, like, you don't have to use just the most recent one and the most... Yeah, I was thinking one. we're getting too good at this. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> some of, yeah. yeah, so, I mean, just not to just kind of overdo it, because I just know that I have to remember, especially with my son, that I just don't want to, like, overdo it so that, like, the, you know, every time he hears about a horrible story, it's like, here we go again type situation. I want him to be aware... But I also, I mean, I think like, you know, Chris brought it up, it's a balance to it, right? It's, it's, it's the world that you live in and the world you want to live in. What can you do to change one into the other? Um, so I just think that that's, that's really, really important. Cool. Well, thank you all for your thoughts. I'm going to stop us here at this point, and thank you so much um, for everything that you've contributed. And, oh, I should thank also Jose... Uh, Wilson, who had to leave, evidently, um, for kicking off, however he kicked it off, some of these debates in um, on all, all of our communities and so forth, and, and for adding here tonight again. I um, want to say that we meet here every Wednesday night um, at this time, and we've been doing it for many years, and we started uh, at the EdTech Talk um, uh, network of the world <laughs> channel of the World Bridges Network with Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier, 
So thank you all for joining us for this episode. And thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Nice meeting you all.